Hi, I'm Dr. Andy Thompson. This is COVID-19 update, April 27, 2020. All data is of 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to account for reporting. All videos can be found on roominfo.com slash blog. Here are the current trajectories, much the same as the last time. The United States has now over 1 million cases. Worldwide, there are now over 3 million cases. Here are the reported cases per million population. Take-home points. Germany is definitely flattening. Canada looks a little bit steeper. Hopefully it will start to flatten soon. And France looks like they're flattening. Here are the percentage of deaths. The highs in France at 14.05%. Low Germany at 3.83%. Canada and the United States both around 5.6%. Here are the actual numbers of deaths over the last five days. The top number is today's uh, number of deaths and the numbers following of the subsequent days. Take-home point here. Deaths are down in all countries, which is great news. Here are the deaths per million population. Take-home point here, Canada is doing actually relatively well. We flattened out a little bit, which is good. Here are the estimated reproduction numbers over seven days. You can see everybody now is under one, so it's the same story. If we zoom in now, we'll see Italy and Spain, Germany, France, United Kingdom, United States, and Canada. Canada is still flat, but it is slowly falling, which is again good news. So new cases per day, everybody is still over the hump. Here are the new cases per day, Italy, Spain, Germany, France, United Kingdom, United States, and Canada. Here are the daily deaths, Italy, and Spain, Germany, France, United Kingdom, United States, and Canada. Everybody seems to have rounded the corner. Here are the new cases per day in Canada. Today we had 1,563 cases. The solid black line is the seven day rolling average. Are we starting to flatten out? Let's hope so. Here are the new, new deaths per day in Canada. Today we had 144 deaths. The black line is a seven day rolling average. Slowly increasing, you expect deaths to lag number of cases. So hopefully this will start to flatten as well. Here are the provincial cases of COVID-19. This is Canada in total, almost 50,000 now. Alberta, British Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec. Here are the other provinces. Nova Scotia again is still leading the way and gaining new cases. Here are the cumulative deaths, Canada, with over 2,500 now, approaching 3,000, Alberta, British Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec, which is certainly separated from Ontario. Now, somebody had asked me to break down community versus long-term care. It's tough to do because it's hard to get the numbers, but this is what I could do. Ontario has had about a quarter of their cases from long-term care, and about three quarters of the deaths in Ontario have been from long-term care. Nova Scotia, about a third of the cases in long-term care, and again, about three quarters of the deaths from long-term care. Alberta, 8% of the cases from long-term care, whereas 30% of the deaths are from long-term care. And Quebec, about a quarter of the cases again from long-term care, and again, about 80% of the deaths from long-term care. British Columbia, about 20% of the deaths, or sorry, the cases are from long-term care, and the large majority of the deaths are from long-term care, although it was really hard to find for BC. Take-home points, 20 to 30% of the cases of COVID-19 occur in long-term care facilities, but the large majority of the deaths in our communities, about 80%, come from these long-term care facilities. That's really terrible if you actually think about it. The question burning in everybody's mind is how many people have IgG antibodies to SARS-CoV-2? Because then you know how many people have been infected in the population, and are we getting close to herd immunity? You want to know the answer? We have absolutely no idea, and that's the honest truth. There have many studies that have been published online that are not peer-reviewed, and so that data is suspect in some of these cases. Some of the tests used to detect IgG have not been approved by the FDA in a number of these studies. Many of the antibody tests have been rushed out and they do not have the precision that we should expect, so you have to be very careful interpreting these results. I'm going to talk about two things, one false positives and one called false negatives. Now, a false positive test is a test that detects an IgG to SARS-CoV-2 when a person's never been infected. 
And that gives that person a false sense of security. Let's say this happened to you. You, you did a test that said you had IgG, but you've never been infected. What this does is it increases the background population rate that we would think. Now, when the FDA looked at 14 tests, they found only three of them were appropriate and gave low numbers of false positives. In fact, many of the tests had about 5% false positives. So if you tested 100 negative samples, 5% would be positive, which is huge. It is absolutely unacceptable to have a test like that. Let's talk about false negatives. They fail to detect an IgG to SARS-CoV-2 when you've been infected. So they say to you, no, I'm sorry, we can't find an antibody, but you've actually had the disease. Of the three of the 14 tests that were okay by the FDA in terms of false positives, they can only detect, detect antibodies about 90% of the time at best. So these tests are not perfect, folks. So what do we know about the rate of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies? Well, in California, it's been estimated that 2.8 to 5% of the population has these antibodies. But again, this data is very suspect, and there's been a lot of criticism uh, by scientists about this data. In New York, anywhere from 13 to 21%, perhaps. In Germany, a single town had 14%, okay, but that was only a single town. Large-scale testing is underway. In Italy, we have no idea. Large-scale testing is underway. And in Spain, I have a good friend who works there. And basically, when you swab somebody for SARS, about 30% of the time that swab comes back negative and you have to do about two or three different swabs. And he's told me the antibody tests that they're using in Spain are not useful at all. People who are positive for SARS by swab are negative for antibody tests all the time. So you have to be very careful, again, interpreting these. And this is from the front lines of someone I know personally working in Spain. So what are the chances that you've had COVID-19? Honestly, we have absolutely no idea. However, it does depend on the background infectivity rate in your area. So the chances, if you live in New York City, that you've had SARS-CoV-2 are probably much greater than in London, Ontario, Canada, for example. I want to look at the death rate in New York City and dispel some of the myths you've been seeing on the internet. There's been 11,708 deaths. They have a population of 8.4 million people. If we assume 15 to 25 percent have been infected, and that's being liberal, anywhere from 1.26 to 2.1 million people in New York may have been infected. The percentage of confirmed deaths from COVID-19 then would be anywhere from 0.55 to 0.93 percent. Remember, the seasonal flu is 0.1 percent. If you include probable deaths, and these are deaths that have occurred in the community that have been thought to be due to COVID-19, you have to add another 5,228 people. So then your percentage of total deaths from COVID-19 increases to 0.81 to 1.34%, which is certainly a lot higher than you would see with the seasonal flu. Two reasons why death from COVID-19 is different from the flu. Number one, look at the numbers. Worst year in the United States, 61,000 deaths due to influenza. That's a total United States. In March and April of 2020, we've already had 57,000 deaths in the United States attributed to COVID-19. And that's just the ones that are confirmed. There's tons of others that are unconfirmed. It's going to be much higher than that when we look at the final numbers. So we're already way above the flu in two months. Number two, the deaths are different. Influenza tends to destabilize underlying medical conditions. Okay, so if you have heart failure or kidney failure, it destabilizes these, and that's ultimately what people die from. SARS-CoV-2 is different. It also destabilizes underlying medical conditions, but it also directly attacks and violently attacks the lungs, heart, and brain. So it's very, very different than influenza. You, we want to keep our eye on these places, and I want to look around probably mid-May, okay, Australia, Okay, so Australia is important. They've got not many cases, but their flu season is typically from June to August. So it's coming up. So it'd be very interesting to see what happens in Australia. Austria, Germany, Denmark, United States and Norway are all starting to relax restrictions. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. All right. Now let's look at some of the graphs. This is Australia. This is where they are now on April 27th. So they've come way down in their new cases. They're starting to relax. Let's see what happens. This is Austria. Again, they've come way down in their cases. Let's see what happens as they start to relax. This is Denmark. Hmm. Not as low in their cases and they're starting to relax. They've got over 100 new cases a day. Let's see what happens in Denmark. This is Germany. Germany's got about 500 cases a day or so. 
Let's see what happens to Germany. Italy. Italy's got almost 2,000 cases, and they're starting to relax. Let's see what happens there. Spain, over 2,500 cases, slowly starting to relax. Let's see what happens in Spain. United States, over 20,000, usually 20 to 30,000 new cases a day. They are starting to relax. Let's see what happens in the United States. And this is Canada. Canada, we have not started to fall off yet. We're over 1,500 new daily cases. In some places, they're starting to relax appropriately. Let's see what happens in Canada. Now, this is a chart that looks at the growth from April 8th to April 27th, roughly in the last three weeks, and the percentage increase since I did this last. The United States has had over half a million cases, growth of about 136%. United Kingdom, about 96,000 cases, a growth of about 158%. And Canada, only about 30,000 cases, but again, that represents 151%. Uh, anywhere from 40 to kind of 55% in Italy, Spain, Germany, and France, ranging from about 45 to 80,000 new cases. Just gives you an idea of the growth of COVID-19 through the month of April. So remember, folks, it's still really important to hold the line. I know we're all getting so tired of these restrictions. We all just want to go out and hug our loved ones. But it's important that we finish this race strong so this thing doesn't flare up on us again. Remember, support your local small businesses and frontline workers. Go to CollinsCoolers.com under Canada Strong. Get one of these awesome hoodies or t-shirts. Go and see Bill again at the PhysiotherapyRoom.com. Get your protective personal equipment. Remember to do your part and flatten the curve. Stay home. Stay safe and please save lives.